Hey, it's Cliff and uh, Coffee Compiler Club, sorry. And uh, here today to talk about compilers or about bugs and large complicated programs or IDEs or performance counters or whatever makes sense. If you recorded, you'll be on YouTube within a couple hours to a day. That's how it goes. Okay. Uh, Levo was just talking about bum rushing his IDE and then discovering all the bugs in the editor and in font rendering. And then we cut you off. I cut you off to start recording. You wanted to say more? Uh, not much more, but uh, there was one thing that I wanted to ask you guys. Um, so if you have some kind of iterator, um, well, right now what I have is um, a next function that uh, increments it and a get function. So um, yeah. I, I have a third one that's like, do I have more? Should that right. tell me if the current index uh, is valid? <laughs> like uh, the yeah. current iterator is valid? Or should it be telling me that I can increment it like once more? Well, so that, I think I had a case where I was expecting one and not the other, but I right. used the function for both cases. So, so I'm going to have to uh, fix that. Java has a well-specified iterator that's easy to use and a pain to write. Um, and because it's easy to use and the goal of an iterator is to take complexity away in the complicated shit because you can always sort out an iterator. So I claim you should do something akin to what Java does there. And they have like, there's a has next. And if has next returns true, the next will promise get you a value. And in normal iterators, it means that has next peaks one ahead. And in like concurrent iterators, has next caches the next thing in case somebody else wants to remove it concurrently behind your back. So if has next says true, you will get a value on the next call. And then if has next says false and you call next, you throw an error. See, that's how I have it implemented now, but I'm hitting a bug and um, yeah, I'm not sure. Like I, I just- The iterator or the morning. use around the iterator? Uh, the use around the iterator. I, I literally just discovered it this morning. Like I noticed the, um, a graphic glitch uh, like earlier this week, but I didn't actually like try to fix it yet. And then when I made the reproducible this morning, it, it blew up on me. And I don't know, it's just really, f it looks funny. Like I'm not sure if the iterator is a problem or if something else is the problem. Right, yeah, right. Well, you wrote your own iterators, right? So you could have a bug in it, a corner case it doesn't handle. Yeah, the iterator is like actually right now, it's probably as big as my uh, debugging code. Like it's really complicated. Oh, like all it right. gets. Well, what's the iterator for looks, then? Uh, okay, so um, I don't know what other editors do, but in VS Code, if you press, uh, you know, if you select a couple of rows, you press Tab, it indents, and if you hold the Shift Tab, it outdents. So what the iterator does, um, it keeps a lot of state around and figure. Oh, okay, wait, my. My source object keeps a lot of uh, state around and the iterator looks at it and figures out what's the proper way to uh, render it and uh, what's the proper characters. So if I indent five times, uh, it's I can essentially flush it and then it will be one undo step. And if you do that in VS Code, uh, you have to like hit undo for every time you hit a uh, tab. I didn't want that. Uh, so it's basically, right. uh, it's basically looking at uh, a couple of dozen variables trying to figure out what the proper state is. So it, it just ended up being really big. It sounds like you could have a bug in there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. The one thing about um, iterators is that because they're supposed to be standalone and stupid, you can write, un uh, you know, unit tests for them. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of uh, unit tests. Uh, one, uh, one thing I, I also made sure to do is if you select a bunch of text, you hit delete and then you press a, it actually just folds it down to uh, selecting a bunch of text and then pressing A, because you would probably want one undo step to, uh, you know, remove the right. A and then bring back all the yeah, text. Yeah, Emacs needed. has the undo thing specified like bunch of white space insert undoes in big chunks. He doesn't take it infinitely, but he'll do big chunks for undos on white spaces. But I think your select, delete, insert a character don't 
fold together. They undo individually. Yeah. So um, not realizing how uh, complicated I made this is, uh, yeah, kind of getting in my way. Yeah. I, I could have done the stupid thing and then just had like 30 frames uh, when I insert text, but, you know, I wanted 144. So. Well, it'll be different on everyone's machine anyhow, but it does sound like you're doing a lot of work there. That's not necessary. Uh, no, no, it's actually, it's, it's quite fast. It's just, uh, there's a lot of code. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see for Yasser's benefit. I'm going to talk about performance counters. Uh, I guess he was trying to do getting perf counters up for his, well, it's, it's, it's whatever silk it's, it's LLVM hack and he's not on right now. So anyhow, um, the, the tier zero counters, so your interpreter counters or your whatever template jet, um, they can be lossy. That's fine. Uh, so don't bother with an atomic update, just do an increment. And, you know, horseshoes and hand grenades, once they cross some threshold, it's time to jit again. Um, it hardly matters what they say. For the tier where you're going to collect precise stats, so I'll call this tier one, it's important to not uh, drop counts in multi-threaded updates because the nature of count for many CPUs, many cores are bumping the same counter is that you get one update per cache line ping pong between cores, but all other updates between other cores just get dropped. So it flattens the rate at which you accumulate stats um, to the rate at which cache lines ping pong from CPUs. And if you have more hot code and less hot code and everyone's banging on all the counters and all the code, because of the flattening of the rate at which you can update counts and the rest of the counts are just lost, um, all the counters flatten out to the same value. They all increase at an average equal rate equal to the cache line ping pong rate which means the hot code looks like the middle hot code. You can't tell them apart, right? You lose distinguishing characteristics. Um, and and in, in a way to demonstrate this is to go uh, run a bunch of threads, bump a small handful of counters between them and look at the rate at which the counters bump up or alternatively look at the total counts you get versus the expected counts if nothing was dropped. And people commonly say, hey, I have a racy counter and I drop a few, it's okay. What is the expected drop rate if this counter is highly contended? Well, if it's not highly contended, the drop rate's expected to be really low. But if it's really high, the actual drop rate you'll get will be something above 99.99%. Nearly all counts will be dropped. Essentially, you divide two big numbers by a large number of drop rate, and you get a random result. And all your counters are effectively middle to high and random and they don't tell you distinguishing who's hot and who's not anymore. So you don't want to drop counters. That was the long explanation I didn't do in Discord. And now you now the, you collect whatever for, you're going to collect. So I, th I think that's an interesting observation about, uh, about collecting profile. Uh, I wonder, how did you come to this conclusion? What was it? Uh, painful, did you see it as a, did, did you experience. see it as a, like, but bad, bad profile and bad performance in the higher tier or just yeah uh, yeah well yeah. no 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 I, I diagnosed it all the way down so crappy code in the high tier and then look at the and weird counter results and then staring at the high tier who's expecting to get kind of trashy counters from the middle tier because he knows counts are dropped and things like that so he does a, a sort of a not the Boris law uh Ball Loris thing, but he does a, an equivalent flow to try and unify the counters to some, make some sort of sense out of them. So the counters are like all over the map, and he's like saying, "Well, I have this counter here and that counter there. They must have come from some shared counter, and and the sum of these two should be split between this guy's total counts, and they're completely off. So I assume some drop ratio, blah blah blah. So I'm trying to sort out what the counts are, and it just comes back that it's garbage numbers. So. You know, I'm, I'm and I'm looking at things that I know, you know, after a while I, I write test cases. I know the frequency between these two paths. There's a 90-10 split because I fucking did it a 90-10 split. But the counters are flat. They're saying 50-50. And so I, I, I went further down the step of diagnosing where that happened here. And it's just the drop count rate just sh shoots to the moon when you have multiple cores contending. And as soon as you have that, then your counts go 
they get flattened at random however fast they can increment and you get guarded you numbers to, to actually off. use atomic increment then or use something um, entirely different yeah so so i think i tried i'm trying to remember what we ended up doing i think what i ended up doing was just living with it but recognizing the case where i had garbage high value counts and switching to static heuristics like i just did loop nesting depth and if tests against null are typically not taken and so on and so on there's a bunch of static heuristics you did if you didn't have any profile counts um but there was definitely a place where i recognize that these counts look garbage to me and i'm going to change them to my static heuristic counts because the counts i got are garbage and the alternative is to do an atomic counter. And on an x86, an atomic add is probably cheap enough and it's good enough. And I would do an atomic add. And on a spark, Yeah, I would think that the, the cast line ping-ponging was just as expensive as the atomic add anyway. Um, the cast line ping-pong dropped counts and the atomic add would not. But it would, Oh, I see what you're saying. But it would be just as expensive? Um, yeah. Maybe. I, it wasn't somehow like the owner who had the line probably got to update a bunch of his counts for a while then the line left and he accumulated rights to the line and the x86 store buffer my theory was was he just took the second third and umpteenth rights in a row to the same word and the store buffer that he right but the cash. same thing would happen with the atomic right he just win a bunch of no but in the atomic, ads. He, uh he should in theory he should fold them up correctly and then when he finally gets the cash line local yeah he would take all the counts he wouldn't drop any and I don't know what the x86 does. I, I've seen reports that are now quite old that he did something in the memory hierarchy that was more efficient and didn't drop counts. But I don't know if he does it at the cache coherency layer or is it as the memory bus layer or where. So yeah, I'm still, I'm Sorry. still afraid of using atomics. It's such a they they can uh, slow down your program by a lot. It, it it's yeah. it's. You know, but it's it's the contention that's slowing it down, the not the atomic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. So don't, don't be afraid of atomics. Be afraid of contention. Yeah. But, 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 this, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I want to say, like, uh, I think uh, something that confused me, uh, like, about all this atomic stuff is, uh, I mean, what you guys were talking about with the atomic ad, you guys are referring to an atomic read modify write, right? Where you're not dropping anything. But the thing no. is, uh, no, we're no. not. Oh. We we're like, talking about I atomic mean, add, uh -huh. where read, modify, write does a general purpose update. An atomic add, the Intel processor is known at some prior generation, I don't know where, to take that update and move it through the cache protocol to the memory somewhere and then do the math there. It's a, it's a stored procedure on memory. Yeah, as opposed to in your L1 cache. So I if see. it's in your oh, L1 wow. cache, it's not in anyone else's L1 cache, and that's the cache line ping pong issue. So it's much slower to do a remodify write in your L1 under contention. Everyone's fighting you for it. Uh, are we talking about uh, the add instruction with uh, the lock? Yeah, lock add. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I didn't know we did that. Um, it, right. So, so the, the, you know, the, the difference here, Bebo, is this is not a concurrent programming. There's nothing dangerous about it in terms of safety per se it's just whether or not your counters drop bits and then what's the cost of everyone's fighting to raise the same counter what if you don't if you remove the lock what if you just have an ad you you lose 99.9 percent .9 of the lot of the ads I, I see. you lose a huge count of them and with lock Sorry. ads you lose less but still can you lose, lose some, none right? with lock ads, uh, you, you lose, lose none but there's um, an unknown amount of performance loss because the ad becomes the locked ad becomes much more expensive and that's yeah, still and, cheaper than see, the have, CAS version. The read uh, I avoid one. all this by using a single producer, single consumer uh, queue. It so doesn't work. That's for how I get around using. If, I, I want performance counters, which that's I not thought it was the performance counters dropping like the okay, counts. Hang on. Or, see if this, is it some, hello? But the lock add is, is that is a read modify write instruction, right? But it's oh, just, it it is just one instruction, one. right? Yeah. And it but never it, fails. I mean, and it doesn't require the cache line locally somehow. I, I think you're describing like 
could you do an atomic add using a CAS loop, right? Yeah, and that's what I think you're doing. Yeah, you certainly can. But it's much, much worse performance wise. Yeah. When um, contending. yeah, but I think only if you're, I guess I don't know. Like after like Haswell or something, CAS went into L2 from main memory. Oh, I think Mark, you just froze up. No, I think I'm thinking too hard. <laughs> <laughs> a, I literally right, froze fine. up. I'm wearing my Java shirt. I was GC. Ah, uh, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Um, so I've seen, seen I've seen know. huge performance gains from Atomic Ad versus CAS loops when okay. there's contention. Okay, that was that was the hope. And then at the time, I was doing Spark chips at the, in parallel with x86, which did not have an Atomic Ad, for which the CAS loop was just too expensive, and so the code generator paths for putting performance counters in just didn't bother. We just dropped the counts, and then once I figured out the bug, I switched to you know ah, I can figure this out in static heuristics. So Cliff, have you seen a uh, manifestation of that as a performance problem in practice? The fact that uh, in uh, in tier one you need to do multi-threaded atomic updates, or it's just hypothetical that we are doing it, it, something that might happen? It happened while I was at Sun, and I had my workaround in place, and I walked away from it. So does it happen right now with the modern hardware? I don't know. I know the counter drop thing happens in modern hardware. I've totally done that. You know, H2O, we did a lot of these things and we did, you, yeah, you drop furiously. Um, is it a, a performance counter issue for the generated code? Hang on, Onat. I, I don't know. Uh, so are I, the performance counters dropping or? Is is it like you know the the count from incrementing a um, value in memory is like that is is because it's not the timing is that like okay so is, is that what you mean by dropping? Yeah, the, the the performance counters are not the hardware performance counters. These are software counters, so it's actually just an add to memory. So there's a memory word that has a count, and you're counting up on it. And if you use a non-atomic add, a non-locked add. And many cores beat on it. Many of the cores will cling to load, add one, store, but many of their updates will be dropped. Yes, 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 yes. I, mean, I thought you, I thought the performance counters themselves were dropping. That's it. Right, Those so. are the performance counters, and they no, are no, dropped. but not not. You're, we're not talking about hardware performance. Yeah, this counters. is software only. Yes, yes, yes. That's what I thought. Like okay, no uh, software and only. And it was like, oh, I didn't know that. And then like, yeah, it, it makes sense. Like, I think it's because like they're loading the um, old values, right? Like, um, th not, that's what's causing dropping. Like, no, it's okay. it's one core wants to read a value he has in his cache and and increment and write it to his store buffer and then load increment store load increment store and the he doesn't have it in his cache line so it's only in his store buffer and he can't get it so his increments are always bumping a, a value which is stale relative to whoever else has the line and when he finally gets the line and he writes his counts out he stomps somebody else's counts with his stale counts and so right person's counts get lost right yes, it's, it's, yes, it's not just that you're like missing one it's that all of a sudden you regress back thousands or, right. or more right right yes you, you right yeah so it's it's a huge loss so today would you use the long adder style of a like stripe 64 adder right doing um that's what I, right i mean that's what that's what non-blocking hash map uses so if I know there's contention there, I'll probably, yeah, I probably would actually. That's a good, well, I would try atomic add on an x86. I'll try atomic add. If that's fast it's enough. Still, atomic add is fast, but it still doesn't scale. Well, you only it have just, to scale to how many cores you uh, Right, it doesn't, it doesn't scale beyond one core, right? It's, Two it's, cores it's get like worse, gets worse performance than one core. All right. Like, yeah, if, but if, it's better than the cast like, if it's not x add, then it should like in theory, because like you're not getting the return value with lock add. So like it's it's fire and forget right, but with like you know because of the x64 the way the way x64 works it has to like lock the cache line well, first before it does that right. No, so, this is this is the case of try it because it, under different yeah. generations of x86 it will behave differently. And what Mark just said is that on something recent it it is uh, uh, atomic add is. Faster than CAS, but slower once contention, slower than plain add once contention hits. 
And then there is another technology called a striped adder. Um, I started with, I told Doug Lee about this one. I don't know if he took it from me first or not, but I hadn't heard it before. It's just stripe your counters on different cash lines and the different cores beat on a different cash line. And then when you need to test for, is it time to JIT or compile or whatever, you have to sum all the counts, but the counters are all running different cash lines. So each core can increment their own. Oh yeah. I've done that too. So it's, well. it's cheap to write and expensive to read. Yes. Yes. All right. And then oh, Arthur, for, you for, for this... something. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. And I think for this application where uh, you're, you read during compilation and compilation is a very expensive activity. I think it's a, it might yeah. be a worthwhile trade-off. And uh, yeah, I asked whether, whether you've seen this as a uh, practical problem, because we suspect we might be encountering this, uh, especially because our uh, second tier compiler is slower. So we actually spend more time uh, in the first tier. So I, I, uh, I don't have like, proof or evidence that this is the case. But yeah, this is one of the things we suspect uh, might be happening. Oh, yeah, I definitely hit it at Sun. And I definitely threw down workarounds. But I didn't go to the atomic ad situation. So if you want to know if you're doing it, you should write some code that's a test case that measures counts, that actually counts locally in knowing a number. And oh, I, I, I'm not saying about the uh, uh, like lossy updates, and uh, but profile, I'm talking about uh, having contention on the counters and this affecting warm-up performance yeah. Uh, because, yeah, because the warm. first year needs to, needs to do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, your counter line. That's what I'm saying. Go go look on your current generation of chips and see how bad it gets, and then go into your tier one and switch to an atomic ad and see what happens. Your counts will surely change, and also the atomic ad might eat a bunch of time, and then you might have to switch again to a stripe adder. Yeah, I think uh, so. The, the the simplest thing we can do actually, we can just stop collecting the counters at some point. Let's say we. I don't know, collected uh, yeah. X thousands of invocations. We say that that's good enough profile. If you didn't get to uh, to promote to final tier and you need to execute in the first tier, well, you'll be executing without collecting the profile. So that's an easy workaround, um, I think. Oh, for the performance, not for the loss yeah, yeah, yeah. counts, but for the performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that, 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 that was my point, that uh, performance is a concern because it takes us longer to compile uh -huh. uh, final tier. Right. No, I just knew C1 was a passing phase, and then you got out of C1. If you hit C1, you either hit C2 because it was important, or you rarely ran and just didn't matter what happened in C1 because you were rarely running. Yeah, I would say uh, that that's kind of the common, that's the common wisdom, but uh, I don't know. We we haven't okay. checked or verified it uh, in a while. So maybe right, with, right, uh, you're, with you're our tier final lot, tier. Yeah. yeah, a lot more expensive. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if, um, so let's say you have a, um, let's say you have a, an if statement. Um, it, it doesn't matter if it's uh, really hot or really cold. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, do you want performance counters on short circuits to build up the, the if statement, like the conditional yeah. part of it? it yeah. So it yeah, actually it, helps. The, the profiling tier wants to know the profile counts on the control flow graph especially short circuits. Those are like, you know, ideal things to optimize for. Because uh, I remember um, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of sh short circuits were, would always just be true if uh, one of the previous was true. Sure. Uh, so I was thinking that could be like, uh, but I, I thought maybe that could be like optimized uh, some other way, like uh, using like some kind of bit, uh, bit uh, operator, but um, yeah, it depends on what so you depends. want stats on those because I thought that it would just be uh, too insignificant. No, when when I get to the control flow graph at the bytecode level, the and 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 or ors in the universe. So there's two different short circuit meanings. I'm I'm, I'm blending in my head here, hearing you talk. And I'm, I'm going to clarify a little bit. So there's and 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 or or short circuits. Um, at the Java bytecode level, it's just control flow graph. Those disappear. Um, and so I have a control flow graph I don't want to put counters on. The other meaning of short circuit in my head is some big function that has some easy test in the beginning that says, I don't need to run the rest of this large function. And then if I were to inline, I don't want to you know, uh, uh, generate code for this giant wad of stuff that rarely executes. But the first thing in is if config bit, don't bother, right? 
And so it never bothers in the second big bit. So you want to have that data to tell you just to cut the compilation off after the initial test. Oh, I see. Because uh, sometimes uh, some of the some parts of the condition is just uh, like a lot of bits to end and compare and all that. The, the the I'm not talking about and and or or for those conditions. I'm talking about behavior of, of people write code. If cache hit return cache, else complicated build it. And it turns out that complicated build it's not hot. It doesn't run very often. Maybe it's a one shot init. Now you want your inlining procedure to say inline the if I have it exit and then the rest of the complicated don't inline because I don't need a JIT code for it. So that's one short circuit on a method where the first instruction in and when you write the code is if something easy, exit quick. Um, okay, and, okay. And the other one is these and, ands, and or, ors, which C2 will totally look at both as control flow and as bit flow and will flip from one to the other formats however he wants. So if you have a uh, bit masking and 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 testings and bit masking again with more, he might turn into a, a Boolean and and do bit masking all the way down the line instead of conditional control flow. And that he kind of goes back and forth on that. Okay, so another one is I'm just wondering because I know it's uh, GCC and Clang do different things. Uh, do you want to avoid memory loads uh, in these cases? Because it seems like GCC doesn't avoid the memory loads and it's faster. So as but a general, I don't know if that's the reason why. As a general rule, C2 doesn't, uh, any compiler was, doesn't want to load memory if you can ever avoid it. So always try to remove memory loads. And because it's okay. Java and not C, you have strong aliasing and you can have strong semantics. You know you can or you cannot. And if you can, by God, you do. If you can remove a load, you do it. I got to figure out why my code is always faster in GCC. Because GCC doesn't avoid it and it's just faster. Well, there may be something else going on then. There's a trade-off there though. Like, <laughs> I mean, uh, I remember, so, I was writing this uh, ISPC uh, version of this CSV challenge, oh, yeah. script, and uh, I noticed that like one of like, lots of times in the loops there would be some counters being incremented for no good reason. It turns out the the compiler tried to avoid a single uh, a single SIMD load at the at the end of the loop. And uh, that's why it butchered the body of the loop. But actually, it didn't make much sense when the loop runs long enough. So I guess there's sometimes also a trade-off there. Um, it just saw the way I wrangled the indices and the way I kind of like split the loop apart into separate pieces, it realized, hey, you're actually, technically, you can cache this last trailing load of the loop. And then it, it uh, butchered the the yeah the code generation for the I remember main body. That. Uh, yeah, that, that's... Um, that sounds like That's a funny. different thing. It sounds like somebody's got performance bug issue around SIMD and loop as opposed to. Well, uh, the, the, the whole thing happened because the compiler was smart enough to realize that like, uh, uh, like a particular load after the loop could be cached. Right. Uh, and and it could be avoided, it. but we then it screwed, screwed up the loop. loop. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I noticed that uh, in a... Uh, Adrian's case, uh, it wasn't auto vectorization, but I noticed uh, every time there's auto vectorization, it does it pretty bad in Clang. Yeah. I, I'm fair to look at what C2 does with auto vectorization. I left, it was just coming online when I left and it was, you know, SSE at the, at the era, but I haven't looked at it in a long time since. Um, okay, I, I don't know if I want to ask this. Maybe I'm not going to like the answer, but um, so what happened with uh, Java and tail calls? Because it sounded like you always oh. wanted it, but you just never did it. Yeah, a um, bunch of people, were, you know, I, I came from a fairly heavy academic background. A lot of academics wanted tail calls. It would fix a lot of bugs. You know, Scala eventually did tail calls the hard way themselves, so I didn't have to deal with the C2 not doing tail calls. And there was sort of an obvious way to fold it into the sea of nodes. And I always had my, my you know, other things going on. So there was a lot of, so I, as I mentioned earlier, there was two years rush to get something going, two years of bug fixing. And then we dribbled on with 
bug fixing and new features, but I was mostly doing the new features and no one else was. And the very slow bug fixing come out of the rest of the team. And uh, and Sun management was starting to fail or Sun was having money issues and other, some particular people whose names I'm not going to name started not wanting to, uh, 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 I won't say be shown up by me, but I was producing more code than the rest of the team. So there was a binary distribution, a logarithmic binary distribution on the team members. I was half of the team for, for total production and 90% of the new code. And because I was half of the team for total production, I was also the highest bug generator. I was also the highest bug fixer. And somebody had it in their head that I was the highest bug generator, so this is bad. So I needed to stop generating bugs. But that meant stop generating code for everybody because that was the combination of things. So I got into basically political wrangling with disgruntled senior engineers who who passively aggressively denied me by refusing to code review anything. So there was a general consensus. We have to have a code review before you push back. And then no one would code review my code. I reviewed everyone's put back without exception. I reviewed all of them. No one would review mine at all at some point. And I just, you know, wasn't any point writing code anymore. And then some crazy guy from some startup called Azul said, Hey, we're doing custom hardware for Java. Come write the JIT. And I was like, oh. Did Azul have tail recursion? I'm sorry? Did Azul have tail recursion? No, I had too many other things to do at Azul. I came in and um, I rewrote a huge chunk of the runtime because that was what was painful about C1 and C2. You couldn't have both C1 and C2 because they're shared, they, they're, they couldn't share runtimes because they treated the stack slightly differently. And uh, the other big one was that the save point stopping was always this giant slow disaster. It had to stop all cores, which on an x86 was okay, got four at best at that era. And a spark was painful at 32, and Azul was going to be hundreds. So stop all cores on hundreds was a disaster. So we had to go replumb the runtime. So I spent a huge amount of time replumbing the runtime. Suddenly, Azul could stop any individual thread in a few nanoseconds and could stop them individually for GC or all at once or whatever, all combinations in between. That turned into low latency GC. Um, I did the basic core port. Then we had like uh, cool instructions that didn't have a natural mapping to any prior hardware specifically for Java. So I went and added those features into the C2 and then we had like transactional memory. So I added that feature into C2. Then we had tiny caches and uh, we badly wanted to stack allocate. So I did a bunch of work on stack allocation and I just never got around to tail calls either at Azul. Although again, the theory was pretty straightforward how to do it. I'm not sure how much benefit tail calls give. It's just like everyone keeps on talking about it, but it never gets done. It's very specific. If you're writing in a functional language, you typically write your loops as tail recursion. And there are some languages which demand an implementation, implement tail recursion so that you can write loops this way and they'll just turn into a loop um, directly via the tail recursion hack. If you are not functional programming, tail recursion is probably not a big deal. There's also this um, using Lambda as a continuation passing style where uh, it yeah. gives you a lot of power and flexibility, but you either have to use tail recursion or trampolines, and the trampolines are really pretty painful. Right. Um, yeah, and that's uh, that software defined for software designed for flexibility book has some really interesting hmm. stuff uh, by uh, Jerry Sussman. Okay, if I link uh, it. On that, I mean, yeah, the whole, I think whole, I, whole, whole I thing before. has been a bugaboo for many years. Yeah. I sure wish JVM had that because, yeah, I've got trying to make the closure place. implementation probably substantially different. Same for Scala. The Scala folks just bit the bullet in full optimizer to put tail calls in at the Scala level and then emit tail call optimized already. Yeah. But that requires you to pretty much have a full blown optimizing compiler to break apart your control flow and rebuild it up from scratch. Yeah. Somebody should build that for closure someday. 
Yeah. There's all these bummed things that aren't happening that people would love to see happen. There you go. Yeah. Big job. And yeah, now it's a big job for me. My head was NC2 20 years ago and I had it all right there and I could have just done it. I was thinking maybe two weeks. Oh, and I got yeah. a little pushback from the security guys who were putting this security manager thing in, which wanted to count stack frames. And uh, they were like, no, 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 you can't do that because stack frames will be messed up. And of course I could have worked around that and not, not tail call through a security manager and whatever, fine. But whatever. Is there, it, I mean, C2 is open source and stuff. I guess somebody could just build it in, but it, open JDK. it, would, yeah. it would be... It wouldn't, it wouldn't have any real adoption. I guess you'd have to do it for your own needs. No, no, no. Open JDK. If you got it pushed back in Open JDK, there's a lot of folks who, who pull down Open JDK belts. Uh, right, is that it, a... Isn't there a whole like standards conformance thing so they don't try and do anything unique? Um, the, the, there is, except that if that's, you... That's just at the API level though, right? Yeah, yeah. This is the as if rule. If you can't detect it using your standards tests, you can't. And so, you know, uh -huh, no problem. If you oh. can only detect it with a security manager that is basically dead, it's in the language, no one uses it. Um, I, I claim that you would get less adoption, but you definitely get some because there's a you know, large enough class of people says, oh, fuck, I've never used a security manager in my life. Why do I care? And nor do many, many libraries. Um, but I think you could work around security manager too. Now, the one thing you couldn't do reliably is stack traces uh, would have busted frames, but they have busted frames already and that's in the spec. So the funny thing about stack traces is if you're running through jitted code and you throw an exception, you only get what, the, what was alive to C2 because if it was dead by C2 standards, there's nothing to rebuild in a stack trace. So you don't necessarily get all the values in a stack trace. If you wrote some counter increment, blah, 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 in a hot loop and then went nested many layers and you threw an exception, when you roll through that hot loop, C2 stripped that counter out, threw it away. Um, oh, wait, you, you're, say, you're, you're saying you will remove it from the, uh, uh, from the interpreter state. The um, debug code that C2 emits will emit <laughs> what is live in the interpreter, but not what is totally present if you only interpret it. I'm not saying this right. There is something I remember going this. I remember seeing this and having to deal and then looking at the stack traces and realizing, you know, we, we argued back when I was at Sun and got that yanked on the stack traces. They do not make a guarantee. So I, I, I'm pretty sure if you do something with stack traces coming out of a hot loop and he's inlined his way through and you're throwing, you'll you'll lose stuff from the interpreter's point of view. I think he, he, I know, in fact, I know he does a C2 does a, it's live from the interpreter or it's not live. Like the interpreter. Oh, but th th this is, this is about values in the, um, in, in the interpreter state. Yeah. You can throw them away if, if you think, if you know that they are not used. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you're also saying that you can throw frames away if they, uh, so if, if C2 are... inline, no, no, no. If C2 inlines right now, no, no, no tail call. If C2 inlines, he, he makes one frame. When he unpacks, he unpacks multiple frames. No frames got thrown away in the unpacked debug info. Okay. If I do tail call elimination, that changes. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the theory I was running with at the time was I could give you an approximation by running a counter that was the number of frames of identical nature that got thrown away. So if... A called B called C called A in a tail call, and you wanted that in a loop. So it was ABC, ABC, ABC in a hot loop. I could count that. Then if you threw an exception, I could say, well, you're 1,700 iterations in. The stack frames need to be 1,700 deep. Now, having said that, you get a stack overflow and you die. So take your pick whether you want to die on a stack overflow on your exception because you expanded the frames or something in the frame expansion technology, whatever, Elided all those frames, but added a new piece of information saying, and repeat these ABC frames 1,700 times. It's to be a, you know, an odd trade. And with, with tail calls, you don't actually, you aren't guaranteed, or sorry, with um, 
continuation passing. You aren't actually guaranteed a uh, any pattern. You yeah. can have uh, just arbitrary lambda being executed at the end of a function, right? And you keep on doing that. That's what the pattern matching library that I did does. And then every now and then I just have to trampoline because the stack gets so ridiculously deep. It's really awful to try and look at the stack traces. At this point, you just don't look at stack traces. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, all right, fine. Uh, yeah, the, the H2O had a different stack trace bug, which was the free replication we did across the cluster got you 30 cores per node times you know, 10 nodes, you'd have three or 400 instances, they all have identical stack traces, plus or minus some levels of recursion, a handful, because we did log tree. So you split and you split and you split. Different points to split, different nodes died. So you would get 10,000 versions of slightly different stack traces, all merging to the same original split point. And we just folded those all together and said, here is an approximate flavored one. And, you know, here's an exact one of many, but within this range, you'll have one to 20 frames, you know, according to whatever the random distribution hit when you blew up. Hmm. And, and, and that was says you could throw frames away and be, you know, in certain circumstances and be entirely productive. It was, very, it was entirely useful. Everyone threw a null pointer check when they split long enough down to finally get to do something on the data because, you know, broken code and then 500 cores all hit the same NPE. So give me an approximate answer. Oh, it looked like this. Oh, and here's the line where in, everyone in PE, fine. Why is Zoom, oh, Zoom is just being a pill. Go away, Zoom. Are all the major implementations uh, based off of uh, uh, OpenJDK and OpenJDK is the original source code that you were on? You're close. Uh, they were all that way until, I mean, when it was closed and then Sun opened and then they tried hard to to fork a, a Oracle only better for money version. And everyone else who's not Oracle does it from OpenJDK and OpenJDK lags Oracle by some time, but not very long these days, as far as I know. Is is J9 still a thing? That was like a completely oh. different. Yeah, it's IBM. That was different. I assume I IBM's being... got it alive on life support for the, it was widely used in the academic community. I was surprised. I've got bit by J9 one time where it's not just that they had their own VM, but they implemented the JDK classes on their own as well. Yeah. Sun so going back to the, the iterator discussion that we had yeah. earlier, like their iterator didn't prefetch. And so you'd actually get like an exception on J9 when you wouldn't get it on anything that used Sun's right. source, Java sources. Right. Okay. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess that's not a guarantee. Oh, no, well, I, think, this... well, I think that spec changed. I don't know if J9 is probably not up to spec 21 or anything like that. Well, this is this is like well, 10 years ago, yeah, okay. like, this, probably longer. This is also this is also a question about spec. And uh, you, you can be correct by the spec, by the spec. But if Hotspot does it differently and there is a lot of existing code that's just implicitly assume Hotspot behavior, yeah. like as a as a implementer of a of a uh, competing JVM. Well, you are in the wrong, and if you want adoption, you will like yep. copy the behavior to the. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Back when I was at Azul, we had the GC issue where we were doing full GCs like every thirty seconds because we could, because they were cheap, because of our done, because our operation was done. But then people were doing weak refs, and weak refs would would clean out if they didn't have a, a point or two of them in a strong GC cycle, and somebody would say throw this weak ref into a hash table, lose all pointers to it, fetch from the hash table via the key, and now I have a strong pointer, but there was a gap where they didn't have a strong pointer. And we would hit that gap reliably because we were GCing so often. And then as you know, Arthur says, you were just wrong. It was technically correct and, and you know politically wrong. So Michael Wolf went back in and added a bunch of delay on when weak refs got to be nuked. They had to survive so many seconds of GC cycles before we would consider them available for destruction. It's just what it was. And then there were plenty of other places where people just did broken things that I would call them out on it. And sometimes they got fixed in, in big, uh, in big uh, uh, three letter acronym companies, uh, uh, JDK builds or, or some sort of frameworks, frameworks were happening all the time. 
somebody was doing a thing where he had a plain old unsynchronized hash table or hash map, hash map. And he would attempt to read from the table while writing to the table without any concurrency. And then occasionally he'd get a null pointer exception. So he would just catch NPE and try it again. Um, except even more rarely, he would get uh, uh, array size exceptions because the table's being resized. And uh, uh, and then occasionally he would corrupt the table because the read would resize and the writer was resizing and the combination of the two would get a circular length list on the overflow buffers. And then when that happened, uh, some thread that was reaching the table for that broken bucket list, it was now cyclic, would search the bucket list looking for a hit and would miss and hit the cycle and just run forever in the cycle. And then it was as a big web server kind of thing that would time out the transaction and kill the thread but not kill the thread, it would restart the transaction and the thread would run on. And because we had so many cores, it would just take that transaction again and run into the hash table, hit the same key, hit the same circular linked list, run forever, throw another thread in, another thread in, another thread in, and it was nonstop. And, and slowly your, your server performance would run downhill as more and more and more cores were running on the same transaction, hitting the same key and the same broken hash map. And uh, that was a bitch to diagnose. Fine. And the, the fix was we we told them to, you know, fucking lock it and walk away. Or switch to concurrent hash map or non-blocking hash map and walk away. The other thing we got hit burned by was um I tried to do the final field optimization and three different frameworks, large heavy duty frameworks, uh, would use reflection to set a final field. They didn't they wanted it to be known final sort of conceptually, like a C const, but they were going to set it one time when something exciting happened. And uh, so the first time you came... <laughs> and it, undefined behavior didn't go over well? Yeah, exactly. So it was set to null originally, and then I jetted in a null check that was optimized out because he knew it was null. And then the reflection set it, and that didn't have any back hooks to the jitted code. So you still got the null check. So after your big app ran a while and you did something in particular suddenly you MPD'd all the time because you changed this final field view reflection. Uh. Yeah, and it's not just reflection. Uh, I think at least for a while, the verifier and hotspot, so the spec was saying that you cannot uh, modify final fields, but you could write bytecode that would pass verification on hotspot. Just there was an emission in the verifier in the hotspot. And I think there was enough like serialization, deserialization frameworks that were using this um, this gap. And uh, yeah, that's why that's why we couldn't like do this. Like plain unsafe. You don't have to talk about unsafe, or are you? No, no, no. I'm saying that just you can generate bytecode that writes into a final field. And uh, up until some, yeah, uh, up until some recent version, um, okay. it would pass verification despite the spec saying that you cannot do that. Right. Okay. And then it's just like, using it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just an omission in the verifier. It's wrong. It should have prohibited that by the spec, but it didn't. And people used it. Right. What's that rule for if anything not spec, not tested can happen? Hiram's law or something? Hiram's rule? Fine. All right. Yes. Yeah. Go, Levo. I was just saying, yeah, because uh, that's it's a uh, Hiram's law. Hiram's law, yeah, okay. It sounds like Hiram knows Murphy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, I wonder if Murphy worked at Google. So uh, I was like wondering, has anyone tried to um, like make a language that's a bit harder to use, but like significantly faster than Java? Because I keep see. on telling people, well, that's that's not a little harder. <laughs> I keep telling people that no one cares about performance, even every time people say, yeah, performance is good. They, they but, do. Uh, yeah. we it's, just, it's all relative. Uh, on the, on the, the target audience for ecstasy, the story is performance turns into money. And people always care about money. 
So if you can drop the money costs, however you do that, and that's, you know, in theory, it's going to be done with some amount of performance and some amount of, um, some in amount practice, of reliable, reliability performance. But hard to code is also money, so. Yes, that's true too. And I, Okay, I, speaking, I, speaking of performance and hard to code, in practice, people use JavaScript on the server. Yeah, no, yes, totally. I don't get it at all. Isn't JavaScript fast now? It's not bad. Under- it, it's slower than Java by somebody said 30% something. That's my that's my go-to number as of however long ago. It's getting stale. Oh, well, I've, my experience is that convincing someone to learn a language is incredibly difficult. There was a phase about 10 or 15 years ago where it was trendy for people who were saying they want to learn a new language every year. And mm. there were lots of people trying to learn different languages and that's i haven't seen that so much lately yeah that's still a thing around again I th- i'm pretty sure it's still a thing and like this gets lots of uh like these type of posts get lots of traffic and impressions uh i think people do it now more than ever actually hmm. which type it's, of post learn new like, language like learning new language and just like how i learned like, a language or niche languages seem to get lots of exposure yeah yeah something like that or just people documenting how they feel about a particular language um, oh. not that pe- many people but, know odin and uh, zig odin zig austral lots of these like smaller niche languages get lots of I, exposure i know some people using zig but not any of the others i mean using it is okay sure it's one thing but uh, People well, I mean, uh, using it for lot. personal projects. I, yeah. uh, I, I just looked at the Wikipedia. Uh, Node has been around for 14 years. And for 14 years, I could not understand why anyone wanted to take JavaScript and use JavaScript more. You're using it already for your browser, and it got really complicated. And you knew you could move some of the chunk that's running in the browser onto the server and change where you pipe the data back and forth, change the pipe place. It was a better place to pipe the data around. So you just wanted to up and move this wad of JavaScript over there from here to there. That's how it starts. I, then you I got, still don't hey, understand. I'm a big GUI web app company. I've got a thousand JavaScript programmers. Well, am I gonna go train them all to use Java on the server? Maybe I'll train them all just to use Node on the server, and skip all that other Training shit. I'm not even sure if there's uh, JavaScript programmers that don't know Java. Well, they, they know of it, but do they know it? <clears throat> yeah. The, it's always amazed me how much people are obsessed with uh, startup time for their programs. So, um, you know, there are some command line scripts that I do and startup time is nice, but people are very obsessive about it. I'm I'm always annoyed at I mean, IntelliJ it, it, startup it, uh, time. Like I guess it matters if you want to have your language include in the... Oh, you're breaking up, Adrian. I'm gonna add I'm gonna add uh I'm also Sorry, always annoyed at how long any yeah, AAA bad. shooter takes to start up. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, for serverless, I guess, like this is uh, one focus, like if you want your language to be very useful in serverless, I mean, there's, I heard that there's lots of effort put into making like Java based or JVM based uh, uh, serverless functions operate well, Uh, like there's a lot of like problems in this space and I don't know, having a fast uh, boot time also for Yeah. yeah, and that that I mean, turns into money because your other options keep that server pinned with the JVM pinned on it and pay the power bill while it runs, or it all goes away to nothing and then it starts on demand. But then you've got latency and you have startup costs. Did you say the everyday? Sh- did you say everyday shooter, the game by John Mack? No, I said any triple A shooter. Okay. <laughs> Currently, I'm waffling between Shatterline and Halo Infinite. And Halo Infinite has a horriblest GUI in a horrible startup time. Fine. But stop. All right, Adrian, you maybe got cut off. No, no, no. I, I make my point. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I also, there have been recently, like, more push to, like, 
from from the folks like that work on I think NetBSD, FreeBSD, and some other uh, OSs on on improving their uh, startup time on like Firecracker, like a KVM based hypervisors, uh, mm. because well they yeah I think AWS uh, their their serverless platforms run, runs these uh, runs Firecracker I think so uh, yeah having having the kernel like not be in the way for these things is uh, it gets important uh, mm. yeah but because for serverless every bit of overhead does actually like add up um, because you do do want to get this infinite scalability kind of like it's never infinite but yeah yeah right it's That's for development on our on our roadmap for ecstasy is the startup experience uh, for development tools i find it important because it drives me crazy that vs code takes a full second just to launch something it didn't need to build like oh, it, that's you and it's, already, it's already built it runs the build system well, but after the build system code. is done it's still another second get off of vs code get a faster i'm, I'm trying <laughs> I'm writing my code as fast as I can, ah, so I can. Get well, you have to get on your VS own code. thing. You could just try somebody else's version. Just, just need a. You just need a fiber internet connection so that when it sends all your all your stuff back to the server, for them to you know check. Oh my god! It's fast. Yes. So all of the yes, all of the spyware that comes in, installed can can go spy on you faster. Exactly. Fine. Emacs. Fine. We're having the Emacs I, versus just, Gradle fight at Ecstasy now. Whatever. Are you still Emacs versus you Gradle? Wait, what? Isn't Emacs an editor uh, in Gradle uh, build I'm, system? I'm sorry. Emacs is a windowing OS that mimics an editor with an IDE yeah. and a few other dozen things, a mail server and a, you know, and a psychotic chat bot and all kinds of other things. Yeah, Emacs, I was about to say, is, Emacs is so much more. It is. It's true. Calculators and games and everything else. Wait, uh, so is that? Uh, I see. I thought that's a meme. So that's actually. A no, thing. it's real. No, no, it's oh, totally God. real. Oh, I, I, I read about like this. it's not a joke. People have made window managers with Emacs, although <clears throat> uh, fairly recently, like a few months ago, somebody did the same with NeoVim, uh, and people were basically like. What you know? What, yeah, but what, Neo why? Vim seems like it's somewhat adopted Emacs's philosophy. Um, I think that's more it's sort of uh, as far as people using editors go. You have basically the people who just use it to get the job done, right? They use whatever the first thing they get their hands on. Like ten years ago, there might have been Eclipse. I don't know if it still exists today. It's whatever the latest thing, VS Code, for example. And if the people who get really into it, like these are basically the same people who like distro hop and tweak the shit and, and there's like no reason for it. They just do it because right. they do it. Right. Because right. when you ask them like, you know, why do you spend your know, hours every week on your conflict? Like, oh, don't you dare question me. Right. I'm, I'm one of those people. Okay. Uh, and you can take it very far to the point where you're like, okay, you know, I already use this for my editing. Why should I also use for email, for example? And there is a legitimate point to be made. Like there is. once upon a time, I considered. Uh, well, Emacs is definitely good at Git. Right. Yes. Uh, but, but that's Emacs kind of where it starts, right? Than if anything else, even especially if you're using like maybe uh, GitHub uh, workflow-based, uh, sorry, uh, email-based workflows for Git, it kind of makes sense that your editor also does emails. Because then you don't have to like switch between you know whatever crappy web UI you use and your editor. And people have done that with NeoVim. I think the the better example people have started porting over Emacs Orc mode, mm. uh, or at least the concept. I think the syntax is a bit different. Uh, I think the th the difference there, at least what I've noticed, is the the target audience is I think or sorry the the people using NeoVim are a little less interested in that. In the sense that with Emacs, people like Orc mode is great, and they use like Emacs for everything. In NeoVim, it feels more like I just want a better code editor, like compared to VS Code or whatever. Uh, and you know, some people take it further, but um, yeah. I think, I by, think by... part of it there's the the like both Emacs and NeoVim are extendable. 
I think Neofim there has the benefit of using Lua opposed to uh, Emacs oh, Lisp. Yeah. Elisp. yeah, Emacs is kind of a pain. But the... Um, the, I think the thing that's mostly holding Neofim back is that whereas Emacs supports um, sort of proper GUI rendering built in, like it has a terminal backend. I think you can do it with Wayland on Linux and whatever on Windows, etc. So it's all like sort of part of Emacs itself. Whereas with Vim and Neovim historically, you've had to install this extra thing. So Vim used to come with uh, GVim, and it was sort of quasi-official in the sense that it was, I think, maintained by the same people. Uh, but it used GTK2, and so at some point people just stopped maintaining it. Uh, I don't know what, what there is today. Uh, but with Neovim, you have like 15 competing GUI applications, and they all kind of suck. Ah. Because shocker, writing a GUI is quite <laughs> difficult. Yes. yes. Uh, especially when it's very text heavy, All right. lots of different languages, like human languages. Um, and Leo, Levo can tell us all about that, right? Yes. <laughs> right. But it so it's like it easy for him to say. Basically, my point is I think the technology is not quite there yet as Emacs is to allow you to really basically run your operating system on NeoVim. My, my current fun Emacs hack is in ecstasy, I'm generating a, a, a map from ecstasy code to Java and then running on the JVM. Well, I spit out Java code. Well, I spit it out in the compile output buffer and then I switch that compile output buffer to Java mode and I get well readable, colorized, indented, blah, 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 Java code that I've automatically generated by hitting make. So I hit a button and splat out comes, you know, miles of pretty printed colorized Java code. And I can go sort my bugs out in the Java code sort of by staring at that I've just emitted. So fun, How many fun, unexpected hack for me was Java mode on the compile buffer. How many people are working on ecstasy? Um, there's like four who are more than half time and there's like four or five more i guess you have to ask cameron who are would like to work more and mark falco is one of them but they have day jobs and so they get to it when they get to it something like that the the cameron and his friend gene have been at it for many years um interpreter only but they have years of producing libraries and code and stuff. So they have a quite a broad, complete, uh, uh, you know, JDK like equivalent. Um, they put some real effort in. So it sounds like it's going to take a long time to complete unless uh, Cameron gets some funding. Um, you know, it's self funded right now. Um, we're picking up speed on that. So I don't know if funding shows, but it's definitely, uh, a work in progress well, has day jobs. And, and some success, you know, heading for getting funding. It, it hasn't happened yet, but it, it, it's not like a goner that'll never happen. I, I think we will get funding at some point. Yeah, the, the challenge there is funding because it, it's something I've been dealing with. Like I am self-funding myself for like two years now. Right. After being in a simpler position over years, I did it in my spare time and just basically realized like I, I don't have the uh, energy uh, to deal with a daytime job and then basically your second uh, late night job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The the thing there with funding is it's mm -hmm. in this weird um, it, it sort of chicken and egg problem. And 30s, Adrian. It, it's this weird chicken and egg problem where you can't get funding unless people are interested. But to get people interested, you need to invest a serious amount of time that likely is going to require funding. Funding, yeah. yeah, yeah unless right. you... Mm -hmm. Unless you're lucky yeah, enough to, I, as sort a of... person who's done funding and been successful at it, I disagree, because my first startup, that's what I tried to do, and that was a completely wrong approach. And my second startup, which was on Tether, I started by simply building the slides, and I spent over the course of the year that I did the fundraising, maybe. 40 hours coding, which was only um, doing some very, very simple uh, stuff just to help myself understand some concepts that were difficult, but nothing, nothing product. 
because if your project project is ambitious enough that you're going to need significant funding, um, unless you have a lot of money and you want to like actually, you know, work on it. Like for instance, for the chip company, there's no way to do it yourself. You need like 20, 30 people and that would be a tiny company and you need hundreds of people to be even still, you're still a small company. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the, the focus was slides. And the crazy thing was that as the slides got better, the deck got shorter and more concise. And in the end, it was like seven slides. That is the record. Which had that much text on them. Yep. And <laughs> that is the thing that you that and that, but then you have to know what you're doing inside out because it's mostly about the conversation. Yeah. Right. right. I, I do. I, I wanted to add there that I'm the the thing that makes this difficult for languages versus is a lot of other software and, and, and just business in general is that with programming languages, there isn't really a clear business model, right? In the sense that if, if you produce a language that's open source, that's not going to bring you immediate revenue or at all, mm -hmm. you have to build something around and that can be support. That's what you see for like a lot of Linux distributions, like Ubuntu, the thing itself is free, but they set up this whole support uh, scheme around it. And similarly, you now see, for example, with uh, Dino, this uh, JavaScript runtime, again, the thing itself is free. Like there's basically no money to be made there other than the goodwill of people, but they built this whole uh, hosting platform around it. Kind of like, uh, as far as I'm concerned, sort of like Heroku, but it's like, hey, if you use our language, all this stuff also works. And if you do that, yeah, definitely it can work. And then you basically follow the sort of tried and proven method of uh, setting up a business funding, et cetera. The challenge there is you basically have to decide, look, what do I want to spend my time on? Building the thing or building the thing on top that makes me money. And at least for me personally, the sort of realization there is that if you you inevitably end up deciding to work on the thing that makes you money because it makes you money and because that pays the bills, which then depending on how you do it can work. Like if you have a team of 10 people, you can kind of balance. Yeah, I think Julia went down this path. There were some core people wanted to do Julia. And then there was a consulting gigs, right? The consulting gigs made the money, but they needed to split the team into we do consulting and we do core Julia. Right. And so you get that sort of, too chicken and neck problem and um i think this is a big problem for a lot of not just languages but a lot of free software in general where because it's free software well it, because it's free software and because people don't want to pay for software uh, or build the platform some like closed source stuff unless you build a business around it or get very lucky it's very difficult to get funding it's never luck i i think yeah, I don't know. My, it, I'm not a particular expert on it, but in my view, the you have to have something that you're solving, and the language part I think is only tangential to that because, like you, you could do like, you know, what ultimately happened with the closure people to, to you know, to the one I'm closest to, so I can use it most easily talk about, is that they built the language based on rich or rich built this language based on philosophy. He built a community around it. Ultimately that spawned a banking startup, which was a good fit for the language and some of the philosophy. And then that banking startup bought Rich's consulting company. And then, you know, and presumably rich made a lot of money on this. I don't know. What, what bank? Uh, new bank, a Brazilian one. Yeah. So, wow. It bought his consulting company, Cognitech. Cognitech mm -hmm. never scaled particularly big. I don't think it was ever more than 20 people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's decent for a software consulting company, but it's not, you know, SAP. Um, and uh, yeah, so like, I think the, but meanwhile, while they were doing the consulting company, the language um, stagnated from a community perspective. Unfortunately, they were mostly debatably, I guess you could debate that they were kind of done the language development in a way. Like there are many things people want, but pretty deliberate and slow about adding to it anyway. So 
there weren't going to be huge changes. So they were able to step away and, uh, you know, do consulting. But even the community development aspect of it was completely stagnated and to the point where, you know, there are lots of people posting, is this language dead? Definitely lost momentum. It plateaued. Um, so we'll see whether this success with New Bank and another banking startup in UK has been quite successful using Clojure as well. And some other, a couple other reasonable success stories, but I don't know. I don't know if it'll be enough to sort of bring it back to life. Uh, I don't remember uh, all the information I read on Redis, but uh, Redis, uh, it seemed like pretty good tech. And I don't know if they got funding or if they were funded from the beginning or what. What's the language? It's not a language. It's um, uh, the it's Redis. Like the, Go ahead. Uh, the more dictionary server. Uh, it's like memcache. It's it's like a, it's an in-memory database. Yeah, they wrote the NoSQL uh, trend, right? Yeah. I, I think they followed a similar pattern where the, the thing itself was open source, but they built a business around it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, like I said, that, that, that is a very successful model. Um, I don't know if it's a model you can do as a sole person. Like, that's something you need to have, let's say, no, five to I, ten yeah, people. I, don't think so. I think at some point you have to scale that out. Right. And then that means you need funding because you, know, you need, need to pay these people somehow, at least well, if, if, if they're working if full you time. you were selling consulting via Inco, and then you got a partner in who liked coding in Inco but didn't want to do the implementation, and then you two started splitting the income money, and he's writing Inco, and you're writing Inco. So he's writing using Inco, and you're writing in Inco. Now you've got a consulting company with two people that really could be self funded. And then you could get to three and four by people doing consulting for a while. And then every so many consultants have enough income in that you would bump your salary or bump a new person to help you and so on. I'm not claiming this is the right path forward. <laughs> Just claiming you but, can do a consulting gig without initial funding. But you're okay. mentioning something, something important because uh, you have to convince a company first to invest in your programming language. That's the yeah, thing. A project, right? At least to start a project uh, with it uh, to see how, is it uh, growing, is it not. And there are tons and thousands of programming languages. Why, why use a new one? Why to throw an investment on something not yet people doing but, consulting but, will hire the consultant because they know them and the consultant says hey i'm doing this and they'll be like make it work i don't care so so it, so basically the consultant the consultant has to mediate the problem in language here in oh, yeah. to uh, either that fit the problem in languages to the to the business yeah, need. Yeah. so yeah i think i think that it could be i think that you could make an argument that a consultant that's developed its own programming language that programming language is some somewhere between a huge drag and no benefit. And that's basically the best you can do. So so the H2O model, which I claim they're still alive, so it's not a huge drag, is you know, there's that open source tool, and then there's basically consulting to go use our fancy tool. But the fancy tool does fancy things that you can't get anywhere else. So that's but is H2O a language? Tool. I'm sorry. Is it's, H2O a language? Um, a no, platform? and yes. It's a stylistic way of writing Java so that you can do big data calculations sort of like hugely faster. And then it's yeah. a large set of libraries that have been carefully engineered to do all the things you get out of uh, R and, and the, the bio communities libraries. I don't remember the name of them. Whatever. There's a bunch of high quality data science libraries. That also work well with big data, like blast like things. But for uh, blast is on the low end of of complexity. But yeah, they do blast like things. But no, these are high high quality. Like, go write a logistic regression. There's a lot of folks in communities not doing. If you're not doing neural nets, you're probably doing random forest, or you're probably doing logistic regressions. Um, there's a couple other big model builders mm -hmm. out there that have interests in different communities, but like. Medical uses a lot of logistic regression. So go write a high quality, big logistic regression. Well, that starts out as doing um, a giant ass, oh, I don't know what you call a thing, AD, AMD, and then 
I can't remember the names now. I have to go hunt them up. I know what they do. Anyhow, there's it's not it's a non-trivial piece of math, and the competing strategies are all written for R or Python or C. And if you're an R in Python, you're terribly slow, especially as data gets big. And if you're written in C, you're generally fragile to use. And you're limited typically to one node, multiple cores, but not one node. And so if your data is bigger than that, you know, then you go to Spark and you go to H2O. And I claim the H2O instances are, are, are implementations are higher quality and much faster than Spark and more difficult to use because you're writing in Java and not in Scala, which whatever reason the, the, the data science community that went this direction found that Scala was easier to use than Java. And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, that was me not understanding the way to invite non-sys developers in, non-system developers in, so fine. By, by the way, uh, about this uh, topic of finding a corporate sponsor or finding the first person or company who would try out your language. I think there are, there are actually quite a few because uh, trying out a language that is not so proven has also benefits. Like uh, if you're in a, a technology space, startup space or something like that, um, having niche uh, and interesting tech is an attraction for talent. Um, so that can be one thing. The other thing is, if you can actually work together with the developer of the language more closely, you can actually affect change. You can become someone who might drive certain decisions or can contribute to the language in a way, like it's a symbiotic relationship a bit. Uh, there are, I think, benefits to be an early adopter, like, like objective benefits. Uh, so yeah, you just have to find your niche, but I think, the, the the problem that you're solving with the language has to be really 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 clear it has to be immediately understood to your target um, right. but uh, yeah i think i think if you get some uh if, if you get enough community involvement and uh, at least show that like your language like so solves the problem of the pitch even if it's not stable you will you, you can definitely find some like corporate adopters it's just that's the thing like if you are um I think uh, if you're pitching a language, which um, I don't know, is more attractive to people who are more, uh, let's say, uh, what is this, um, like risk averse, maybe. Yeah. Um, then, then that that's that's difficult. That's a difficult sell. Like, uh, if you I don't know. I guess if you're competing with uh, like uh, with with Java or something, like trying to pitch a language for writing. Like business oriented applications, I I guess a bit like ecstasy, like um, if you will pitch it to consultancies or or not consultancies, but like larger businesses with established processes and stuff, like making the pitch there is more difficult, versus uh, I don't know, um, a wacky I don't know systems programming language. I feel like the the pitch is a bit easier because um, yeah, like, this is I, I guess... all about knowing your target audience. I'm yeah, not but also also the, just the fact that the certain target audiences are inherently sometimes like more or less risk averse. That's also like the yep. Uh, it know, it Bank of it America. is surprisingly difficult to counter this simple. Everyone else does it in C or C plus plus. Therefore, you know, I think we should do it in C plus plus when you're dealing with someone who's not technical, or dealing with someone who's only ever used C plus plus. So right, like, there, there's a skill to sell to large enterprises and that that's, you can work around these things, but you need somebody who's an expert at selling into some of these big companies, you know, Bank of America or, or American Express, things like that, because they are risk adverse. But inside of the company, there will be champions who are trying to get a problem solved and know that the existing solutions aren't working. And they sometimes can get a free hand to see if something happens. And if you get that champion in top, inside signed up, then you can come in with a funny new tech and make it go. So th th there's a different timing of things is important because they have budget cycles that come around in certain ways. And they have, you have to have a champion internally um, who, who's going to eat the bullet if it doesn't work. Yeah. Don't pitch your programming that. language in December. <laughs> Sorry. 
you uh, just ev like everyone is like freezing the spreadsheets trying to make like finish accounting for the year you yeah right but it's not it's not the, for, it's, for, it's maybe, the fiscal year so it's not december yeah never mind then <laughs> but there is a point in time and it varies by company and you can find that point in time and know that the budget will freeze three months earlier. But that varies. The bigger the company, the earlier it freezes. But so you need an expert for B of A versus Bank of America, whereas somebody who sells to small to mid-tier banks will know that it, most of them are using the early June fiscal year and therefore they're mostly freezing by April or Mar March and therefore, and you know, da, 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 da. Go talk to the insurance companies because you can give them a better model for you know risk assessment. Hmm. Um, See, I'm not sure if uh, showing that you can solve a problem or your language solves a problem is enough, because my language is um, it solves a couple of problems and it does it right now, but it's very incomplete. It has to solve so, a problem that I have. The thing is, like, there yeah, are like the, certain... the, the incompleteness negates the problems it solves. No, but, but you're it's not the sure. The lack really... of connection from your language to a real world problem. So, if I'm an insurance company and I, one of my problems happens to be I need to do better uh, risk calculations, and I have a lot of data gathered over 30 years, and I'm trying to go do some fancy computation. And in the end, I'm going to come up with a binary decision. I want to do a logistic regression on a few terabytes of data and tell this customer who's walked in the door, yes or no. Okay, it has nothing to do with Bolin. It has everything to do with uh, understanding the insurance industry and how it works and how to handle big data. I need a data scientist who's come to me and says, I've been using R and subsample data and I get this level. I've played with this H2O tool and I'm running on the terabyte of data and I get this other model has a much tighter risk, risk assessment um, now he's selling his skill on top of your tool, but it has nothing to do with Bolin or Java. It has to do with, I'm solving a problem. In my case, it happened to be big data and data science. In, in, in my experience, you, the person introducing a new programming language or a extreme or a experimental programming language or something they didn't try it off has to have extremely close connections to the executives. So they, they can influence that. You, you so, can start that way, but it, that's not necessary. Yes, it's not necessary. Or you, you, know, so, or what, you what, solve some real problem that people have. like. Yeah. That's, um, okay. So, uh, and, okay. That's that's and too. a good way of doing that is to create a product. So, like, you know, and so oftentimes the people who actually make a language run like popular aren't the people who actually came up with the language. But a great example is with Ruby and the Thirty Seven Signals guys. Mm -hmm. Right. So those guys built themselves a product, which was their base camp thing, and all the other related stuff. And they build a framework to build it and they open sourced that framework and they hyped it. These guys were very good at selling. And this just hit just very well. And um, but, that caused Ruby to become very popular for a while. But that just matched the market demand for everyone wanting to build a site. So, well, um, yes, because they, they were, solved the problem. They solved a problem. That's that's the key thing. So they solved their own problem. They built their own business. Their business was not Ruby or right. Rails. Their business was Basecamp or whatever it was. And there and is a problem. What, that what? Campfire thing, which became Slack when somebody when Slack knocked it off, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other stuff. And so they built all this stuff using their framework, which they created for themselves called rails and that yeah. drove the adoption and uh like the development of the ruby language which it was built on mm. and, but like you know if you want to be super successful i think with your own language you basically should follow the 37 signals model mm. that's my view but then again of course, the I, I don't know their marketing to the Ruby language for, for but for a new language, what problem the new programming language solves. So Ruby that's... was as good as a new language. Mm -hmm. Um it was unfamiliar to everyone outside of Japan, I think. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and yeah, I, it solved problems. It was solved similar kinds of problems that Python solved, and those both became very popular languages. And, you know, it had some hey, flaws hey, hey. and stuff that people have come to recognize, and so now it's not the most popular. Ooh, new design. No, it's actually very old. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, by the way, I noticed on house. the recording, Cliff, that your view is not you're the one that we never see in the recordings. Have you? Oh, I'm I think turning off self view because it's front and center and distracting to stare myself at a mirror. All right. I should leave it on for the recording. Uh, I got to move myself off front and center then. That's the yeah. Because then you're not in the recording. Nobody mm -hmm. knows what you're holding up to the camera. <laughs> yeah, fine. Um, and somewhere in this house, I have a giant roll of stickers. And uh, and the T-shirts though were expensive and a lot of work, so I have to get enough demand to go make another to convince my wife to make another run of T-shirts. All right, that's the cricket thing, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I have two, and the black one she likes the black shirt with the coffee colored, as opposed to the coffee colored with the black. Hmm. So the next round of T-shirts might be inverted color scheme. I won't. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ted. Go ahead, Ted. Yeah, I... I, I was going to talk about compilers again. Uh, Go ahead. It's coffee compiler. It's yes. topic, yeah. Do it. No, 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 no. But basically, uh, I wanted to say about the solving a problem, you know, like just, uh, uh, I also think like um, many times languages would advertise with things that are technically not pr problems or solving problems directly, like simplicity. Like, the, I mean, um, this, that's things like simplicity or readability or, or whatever those are design yeah. principles or yeah. like you know uh yeah right but i think i think that sometimes um language designers would think a lot about a principled approach to uh designing a language um but having good principles i mean like they would probably have intuition for it because of their years of writing software and that's why they they, they are, but like uh I mean, simplicity on its own that doesn't solve a problem. Like it, it can help solve particular problems. Maybe you should probably list them. But like, uh, it's just th that on its own. Like the design principles, yeah. like they, I, yeah, uh, I, they, I, they don't. Uh, yeah. So the res response to what you're saying, my view is that if your language is really solving so many problems, then, like, you should either directly or together with someone use it to solve a real world problem and spin a business out that uses it and that shows the advantage and anyway it'll be your best source of feedback and you know but if you're if you just believe that your language is solving lots of problems but it doesn't you'll probably find that out when you try and build something and you realize that you have no advantage solve the problem and, in your head but not a problem in anyone else's head yeah that's like a lot of times i feel like the case for these uh vert style languages um i mean I, I, you can see it i think like uh languages that are built to be easy to teach um you're not going to be able to build a like or like those those languages are not a great um uh, argument for there's only one language that's good because, to teach uh, English. It's uh, the head, the the heavy language. I think uh, Cliff got someone got annoyed that one plus one was eleven. Which language? Uh, it's Fuck. I think it's called. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it properly. It might be Headly or Heady. Uh, basically, um, it's Python, but it's a couple steps uh, before that, and every level uh, increments how Python like it becomes. Racket. So at the beginning, one plus one is eleven. But when you get to a certain level, it becomes two. And there's then a, there's other... a language, there's a series of teaching languages called Racket, and then they have some ratcheting level of difficulty. But I don't know this if that's one, what you're talking about. This one is for school, uh, like uh, 10 year olds. Oh, uh, no. Uh, I'm not sure that one plus one equals 11, 11 is, is very is helpful, good, even for 10 year olds. Yeah, that, that's not necessarily a good answer, no matter what. <laughs> so last year I did what was called Tick 80. It was a it was an 80s era Nintendo faker, basic graphics and programming, and you could do the edit debug 
uh, execute cycle really quickly. You edit and hit a key, and then it would run. You'd stare and you'd think of what happened. Then you'd flip back to the editor and change it and run it again. And it had these kids write a little video game. Um, and I think that one, that one for kids like under 10, not so many made the right connection. They could kind of sort of, for kids between 12 and 15, they pretty reliably made a connection and a couple of them went really far pretty quickly once they figured it out that they, they really took off and they added a bunch of new features to the video game and made it really work. But the, the, the key in my head was video games of entertainment really quick edit, compile, debug, looping cycle. And then they still needed an hour of how the connections are made. You change this string, the title changes. Oh, make the title your name. Oh, that's fun. Okay. You change this thing. And now the arrow key makes the little dude run to the right till he runs to the edge and then he stops. Oh, but he doesn't go left. And now add one for each of the cardinal directions. Oh, I can steer my dude around. And the map was given, but you can go hack the map. Oh, here's how you hack the map. Ah, the map changes. The dude's running the maze. Okay, now there's something else. He's trying to pick up food items or whatever, and there's a score and blah, and you just incrementally built up. But you started the kids with a inviting game, and you know the language was coding was essentially basic. I, I think uh, in the head and language, uh, you you introduce uh, you know hello world, and then you can put in numbers. And I guess uh, bec because this is like school age kids, uh, I think they just thought everything was strings. You gotta, you and gotta that's. A name? You keep um, Eddie or Heather. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll link in in a moment. But um, but uh, because you start with prints and they didn't introduce strings, there's no difference. The the kids don't know what the difference between a number and a string is. They just think everything's a string. And then once you introduce ah. strings, I think that's when they introduce uh, one plus one being two. Well, and uh, it strings. was actually it was quite fun to go through. But I like I I think that's like the only language that. You can teach like a five-year-old or a ten-year-old. No, it's not the only language. That's what I was just saying that that it was not the only language. I definitely uh, the only good language because uh, I've seen people try to teach Python, and um, other people just they just don't get it. Uh, I'm I'm okay with people having trouble learning Python at that age. That makes total sense. Just saying, mm. it doesn't have to be. This I meant at like 14, 15, uh, like I'm in my grade nine. The key is get it to edit, edit debug, uh, code cycle fast, right? Yeah. Get to where you can get feedback, visual feedback from editing. That's the key to draw them in. Once they get suckered in, they start fooling around and pretty soon they're making shit happen. Yeah. But they have to get suckered in. That's why I want that that really I, fast. The way that uh, I got I, suckered in was when I was like eight or nine, and it was actually my friend's like IBM PC or uh, hex editing binaries and being like, "Hey, look, I can change what it says." But if I if I you know make the string if I make the text like a different length, it doesn't work. <laughs> right. You and, were getting, uh, you were getting yeah, rapid was, feedback. Yeah. Not super rapid, but yeah, like very confused, but it was kind of fun. Yeah, my, my dad showed up with a very early video game, Atari-like thing, and we loved it. And it was computer. And I had some prior experience on a cardboard only thing from Bell Labs called a bug computer. It was cardboard only. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, sir. I have to find it. There's a Wikipedia link on the damn thing. Um, let me go... And da, 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 da. okay, now it's not finding it instantly. I, I've put it on Coffee Club before. Um, fine, I'll go hunt it down. Anyhow, it was, you know, this is how a computer works. And then at some point, maybe when I was 11, I got access to school, my, my mom's university, which gave me a, access to a mainframe with punched cards. And so I did little things with mainframe and punched cards and, you know, print out prints that made big pictures of whatever, or printed out calendars. I think I got a NIM game where every move required you to change your, your move into a punched card and then add it to the deck and run through the mainframe again. And that uh, sounds time consuming to play. 
Oh yeah, totally. Well, it's just a, you know, I was just like fooling around. Oh my God, what can I do with this thing? Holy crap. I can do this thing. I can do that thing. And then uh, sometime not long after I got my first hand computer I had an earlier, earlier board only thing that was 256 bytes. And then uh, I just want to say, what was the in between TI programmable calculator and then a trash 80 by the time I was 14 or something. And then off and away doing compilers at 15 and stuff like that. Crazy stuff. Fine. All right. Uh, I'm going to wind it down. So we're going to take, take another, any other requests here? All quiet. All right. Uh, yeah, it's pretty good, pretty good meeting for a small group, but it seems a lot of ground coverage. All good. So, um, to meet again. Bye. Bye. -bye. See ya. Bye, Bye everyone.